about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to the business office. Past records show that you can expect 170 crimes to occur in the city during the next 24 hours. You don't know where. You don't know when. Your job, handle them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, July 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We'd been assigned to the business office, morning watch. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Gilbert. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the coffee room, and it was 12, 10 a.m. when I got back to room 21, the business office. Well, if I went... Hey. Who are you talking to, buddy? Oh, hi, Joe. Hi. Right. Hey, try to stay around, will you? Huh? I've been here 20 minutes. I've had 29 phone calls and written three reports. Okay, I brought you some coffee back. Oh, thanks. Hey, how you feel? Any better? Oh, a little bit. I don't know what it is. I ache all over. I think I'm coming down with a cold. That's too bad. A lot of that going around. Yeah. Where's Skipper? Well, he ran over to the crime lab. Want to talk to Pinker? Mm-hmm. How about the pool card? Did you check them? Yeah, the book's here someplace. There it is, right on that paper there. No, yeah. over there. There. Oh. Yeah, five of them out. Check the book. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Something we can do for you? You a detective? Yes, ma'am. That's right. All right, young man, my car's been stolen. All right. I told one of the officers on the corner about it, but he said it might work faster if I came up here. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Now, the car's stolen. All you've got to do is go out and find it. Just find oh. my car. What kind of a car is it? Well, it was a brand-new Chevrolet. That's 1954? That's right. Bell Air with the windows that fold down. All right. Now, we'll need to know some more things here before we can start looking for it. Yes, what's that? Your name? Avis Bowen. Mm-hmm. That's A-V-I-F. Well, that's right. There's no other way to spell it. Avis Bowen. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a middle initial? R. Hope you're not going to ask me what it stands for. No, that won't be necessary. There isn't anybody that knows what my middle name is. Yes, ma'am. All we want is the initial. Well, that's all you're going to get. All right, Mrs. Bowen. It's Miss. Mm -hmm. What's the license number? Oh, well, now, I, I think it's 1U44441. All right. Wait just a moment, please. Uh, who are you calling now? DMV. Well, who's that? Department of Motor Vehicles. Oh, my, all this going on. It's a wonder you ever catch anybody. Hi, Harry. This is Friday over at the business office. California license, one union, 44441. That's right. Now tell them it's a Bel Air with the windows that fold down by themselves. Yes, ma'am, I'll do. Doesn't it? Well, hold on here. You sure about that license number? Well, what do you mean? Well, it kind of looks like you made a little mistake, Miss Bowen. I did not. The car stole it. Yes, we understand that, but you gave us the wrong license number. 1U44441. I remember it because of all the fours. Harry, I'll call you back. Uh, Miss Bowen, that number is registered to a 1940 Studebaker. My license number? Well, I don't know, but the one you gave me, yes, ma'am. 1954 Chevrolet Bel Air. Windows that fold down by themselves. Yes, ma'am, I understand. There must be several hundred cars that look like that. You've seen them before. Well, you act like you've never seen a car like that. There are lots of them around. Mine's light blue with a gold on top. Uh-huh. We still need the license number. Do you think you have it at home? Yes, I, I guess so. All right, fine. If you'll phone it in to us, we can start looking for it. Well, how do you expect me to get there? Ma'am? Home. How do you expect me to get there? We'll have a car drop you off. Well, it's about time I was getting some kind of service around here. Yes, ma'am. I think I'll write a letter to the papers about this. All right, ma'am. The whole thing, right down to that TMV or whatever it is, expose the whole mess. Oh, you're going to be mighty sorry you ever opened this can of beans. We're doing the best we can, ma'am. Well, that's not very much. Standing around here making phone calls isn't finding my car. Well, you said it yourself, didn't you? What's that? There must be several hundred cars like yours here in the city. Yes. 
Well, without the right license number, how are we going to find it? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ma'am? You're nothing but a fake. I beg your pardon? You ain't no detective. The business office, room 21. It's open 24 hours a day, but it's after the detective division closes that it begins to work. While patrol units in the city function normally, the men in the business office give advice on booking procedure, policy matters, and other police business. They issue pool cars and riot guns, and in the event of an emergency, they act as advisors in an overall plan for the dispersal of policemen. The captain on duty is, in effect, the acting chief of police. On the average weeknight, the activities are slow and routine. But over the weekend, the men involved can expect to handle several hundred phone calls from the thousands put through the complaint board. These calls deal with every crime in the municipal and penal code. In addition to this, they handle the citizen traffic through the city hall. Next door is a report room where statements are taken and forwarded to the captains of the detective divisions for appropriate action. Frank and I had checked in at 12 midnight, and for the following half hour, we did business as usual. At 12.41 a.m., we got a hotshot call reporting the sound of shots in the 4200 block on Albany Street. At 12.43, the call was changed to a shooting and ambulance follow-up. At 12.45, the hotshot phone rang again. Is that the shooting? Yeah, it's a homicide now. You gonna call a unit? Better have them check it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same address as the shot? A couple of houses down. This is Friday, business office. Will you put out a call to 1K5? Have them cover the shooting and ambulance follow-up at 4289. That's 4289 Albany. You got it. Right, thank you. Looks like a good one, huh? Yeah. Turns out, and we'll get Geezy out of bed. Well, that'll make him happy. He'll end up in their laps. Mm. All right, Joe. Bob, what do you got? Oh, you want to sit down there, Pop? Who's he? I don't know. We found him in front of one of the burlesque houses on Main. Mm -hmm. The place was closed. He was just standing out there looking at the pictures. You got a name on him? Mm-mm. Haven't been able to get him to say anything. You want to give it a try? All right. You want to tell us who you are, old fella? Come on, we want to help you, but there's not much we can do if you won't tell us your name. Doing about as good as we did. Okay, I look pretty wobbly when we stop. Oh, yeah. well, what do you want to do? Well, we'll have to take him over to Georgia Street. Wait a minute. You got a wallet? All right, let me look at it, will you? Maybe there's something in here that'll help us. Yeah. And the money? No. A few cards here. Nothing with a name on it. What's that one there? Something written on the back. Looks like a phone number. Yeah, that's what it is. You want to call and see if they know who he is? Yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah. He just sits still right there. Hello, this is Officer Frank Smith, Los Angeles Police Department. No, there was nothing wrong. Now, we have a man here in the office. He's carrying a card with his phone on it. I wonder if you can tell us who he is. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Well, he looks to be in his late 70s. He's got white hair. That's right. Well, he's wearing a brown wool sweater, black pants, and a black felt hat. That's right. You want to give me that again? Mm -hmm. No. No, he's all right. That's right, we'll have him brought home. Right away. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Now we got it. His name's McKinley Dunn. He lives out on Vincent Avenue in Highland Park. Talked to his daughter. Yeah. She says they got into an argument after breakfast. McKinley here just got up and walked out of the house. She hasn't seen him since. Pretty worried about him. Mm, figures. Says she's always kind of independent. Well, better run him home. Huh? Hey, you want us to take care of him? No, we can't have you out of service that long. I'll call Highland Park, have them pick him up. You want to take him over to York Boulevard and make a transfer there, Bob? Sure thing. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Dunn. Here you are. Let's put this back in your pocket. Oh, come on, sir. We'll take you home. Thanks, Joe. There's no trouble, Bob. Tell the boys from Highland Park to have his daughter put a card in the wallet with all the information on it. Will you make it easier next time? Sure. The card's not going to do any good, Joe. Mm -hmm. The card's not going to help. His daughter says she always puts one in. As soon as the old man gets out of the house, he tears it up. Mm -hmm. I got it. Business office, Friday. Uh-huh. Photographer get there? How many? You get the story? Yeah, we'll bring him in. Do what you can. 
All right, we'll see you then. That's Sam and 1K5 on the shooting. Yeah. They got two suspects in custody. They're bringing them both in. Uh-huh. Third man left the scene. Sam says the accidental death possibility is out now. Yeah. It's a clean case of murder. Ten minutes later, the officers in Unit 1K5 arrived with the two suspects. They were identified as Fred and Harriet Purcell. The names were run through R&I, but no record was found on either one of them. It was obvious that the two people had been drinking heavily. The husband was taken to the report room while Frank and I questioned the woman. I don't remember too good. Everything seemed to happen so fast. Just all of a sudden, there was this kind of noise, and Norman was dead. Norman, is that the victim? Yeah. Uh, Norman Mancrease. You must know who had the gun. I've been saying that to myself, but it doesn't do anything. I guess I had too much to drink. Who else is in the apartment with you? Now, you mean besides Fred and me? That's right. It's just the three of us, that's all. We got a report there was another man present. Well, then you know more than me. All right, you want to give us the whole story? New beginning when? From the start. Okay. I had a tooth pull this morning. I guess that's what caused all the trouble. How's that? My truth was impacted. I had it pulled, and the dentist gave me a shot of Novocaine, and you pull it to a can, can't you? Mm -hmm. Right, I can't. Mm -hmm. well, I got home, and the Novocaine started to wear off. The whole side of my face started to hurt terrible. Yeah. Well, I told Fred about it. I was a terrible thing. I tried to tell him how much it hurt. Mm -hmm. He's a clod. Told me to have a drink and forget it. And it wasn't long before we were having the beef. Oh, Fred, he isn't very bright at times, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd have a little sympathy for his wife at a time like that. Yes, sir. Not old Fred. He's a clod. Told me to pour myself a little drinky and shut up. Was Man Creep there at the time? Yeah. Him and Fred had been playing pinochle when I came home. I guess they'd been at it all afternoon. Mm -hmm. Norman was on my side. He made Fred mad. And we got to fighting pretty good. Norman was right with me. Yeah. Telling Fred he ought to be quiet. I think Fred was sore about being beat at Pinnacle. He thinks he's a pretty good player. Wasn't long after that, there was a shot, and Norman was dead. Were you in the room at the time? No. Well, where were you? Out in the kitchen. I went out to get some more ice. Well, who was in the room when you left? Just Fred and Norman. No one else? If there was, I would have told you. Just a minute. I'll get it. It was always Friday. No man. No, ma'am, you'll have to call in tomorrow. That... Yes, ma'am. That's right. Let's go on here. You know Mrs. Regman? No. Mrs. Leo Regman? Yeah, what about her? She told the investigating officers there was another man in the apartment. Said that he left right after she heard the shots. She would. No, he's got her nose where it doesn't belong. Oh, well, she's pretty certain about what she saw. Then ask her. Or she saw the man. Let her tell you who he was. You don't think it'd be better if you did? Then it ain't gonna be good, because I don't know. Did you hear anybody come into the place when you were in the kitchen? Oh. Nope. You're pretty sure of that, huh? Now, look. I got enough trouble. Me and my old man's in jail. My face feels like it's coming off. I want to get home and get some sleep. If I knew anything, I'd have told you a long time ago. Now, leave me alone. What did you do after you heard the shot? Went in to see what it was. Mm-hmm. That's all. Just opened the door and looked. Norman was lying there on the floor. Where's your husband? Just standing there looking at Norman. Where was the gun? Fred had it. Whose gun is it? I don't know. You never saw it before? I don't like guns. I don't like to have them around. I don't look at them when they are. I never saw it before. You talked to Fred yet? No, not yet. No. Well, he'll tell you the same story, same way I told it. You'll see. There's no need to even talk to him. Is that right? Sure. You already got it the way I told you. What more do you want? Just one thing I can think of. Yeah? The truth. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Frank and I attempted to talk to the husband, Fred Purcell. He was too drunk to be coherent. We made arrangements for some hot coffee to be brought in. His wife was taken to the interrogation room to wait until we could fill out the reports. At 4.20 a.m., we got another hot shot call regarding a cutting on South 5th Street. The investigating officers found the knifing had resulted from a quarrel between a man and his common-law wife. The woman was in critical condition. 
She was removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and the husband was booked in at the main jail on charges of assault with a deadly weapon. We notified Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and Captain Lorman of the shooting and the cutting. During the next hour, there were two armed robbery reports, several burglaries, and numerous fights. 5.31 a.m., Frank went down the hall and brought back two beef and cheese sandwiches and some coffee. At 5.46, we got a call from the men in Unit 1K5 telling us that they were on the way into the office with the gun that had been used in the killing of Norman Mancrief. Ten minutes later, two uniformed officers brought in a pair of possible car thieves. One of them was held in the hall while Frank and I talked to the driver of the car, a Melville Hulbert, age 19. Where'd you get the car? I bought it. Where? Well, from a lady. She put an ad in the paper, said she had this year a sharp 52 Ford for sale. You remember what paper? Oh, well, no, sir. Yeah, I think it was one of them morning ones. When'd you buy the car? I don't know. Well, you must have some idea. I reckon maybe it was in uh, January. Yeah, around there in January. Uh -huh. Let me take a look at your driver's license, will you? Yes, sir. Take hey, y'all. Take it out of the wallet, will you? Oh, yes, sir. Here it is. Is this your present address? Sir? You still live here on Echo Park Boulevard? Oh, no, sir, I moved. I got me a place over on Olympic. How long you live there? You mean on Olympic, sir? That's right. I don't know. Reckon maybe a couple months. Don't you know for sure? Well, see, see, I got this here bad memory. I, I think it's been a couple months. You live with your family? No, sir. They down south. Where's that? New Orleans. Do they know you're out here? Yes, sir. When'd you come to California? August. Last year? Oh, uh, yeah, last year. You got a job? Aircraft factory out in the valley. It's kind of a long drive to work for you, isn't it? Yes, sir. But I got a good deal on the place I live at, see? How come you haven't reported the change of address to the Department of Motor Vehicles? Reckon I just forgot. I got this here bad memory, you know. When you bought the car, did you finance it? Sir? You buy it on time, you pay cash for it. The cash. You got the pink slip then, haven't you? The lady sold it to me, signed it. Where is it? I don't know, sir. Didn't she give it to you? No, sir. She just told me she was going to send it to Sacramento or someplace. Did you get any kind of a receipt for your money? Yes, sir. Well, where is it? In my wallet. Let's see it. Yes, sir. I got it right here someplace. Pretty funny about this. What's that? Well, I wouldn't steal no car. It's pretty funny you think I did. Mm -hmm. All right, now how about that receipt? Has he found it yet? Yes, sir. Now, here it is. Who wrote this? The lady sold me the car. Is this her name here? Oh, yeah, I guess so. She wrote it. When did you say you bought the car? Well, January, I guess. This year, huh? Yes, sir. You sure you couldn't be wrong about the date? Well, now I don't know. Maybe. Where'd you meet the woman who wrote this receipt? At her place? Where's that? Out in uh, Westwood. I think that's what you call it. Apartment out there. You remember the address? No, sir. You not got any idea at all where it is, huh? Well, I was up on Wiltshire. I know that. Uh, apartment on the second floor. Mm-hmm. I think it was number B or something like that. I don't know. Right. Yeah, sir. Now, what'd you make all that big deal about when I bought the car? Date on the bill of sale is a year ago. Oh, somebody must have made a mistake. Now, we knew that when you walked in. We're trying to find out who. What do you got, anything? Yeah, it checks out. Names in the book. Less Department D. Yeah, now, that could be it. I know that it was on the second floor. It looks right out on Wilshire Boulevard. All right, Mel. You go over there and sit down. We'll be right with you. It's going to be okay? We'll see. Now, look, I didn't steal that car, mister. I should have told him about how I moved. But I did not steal the car. All right. You go ahead and sit down, will you? Yes, sir. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Seems to check out. Date on the bill of sale could be a mistake. Woman might have just written the wrong year. Yeah, it's pretty close to first. Could happen. Mm -hmm. I hate to give the kid his first felony booking, don't you? Yeah. What do you want to do? Well, let's hold him over till we can check with the woman. Huh? Yeah. Officers? Hmm? Gonna be all right? We'll see. You ain't going to send me to jail. No, not yet. You can wait down the hall, will you? Now, as long as you know I did not steal a car. We'll check with the woman first thing in the morning. I want to tell you one thing, though. Yes, sir? We're going to give you a break by not booking you right now. Don't make us sorry about it. Oh, no, sir. Thank you. All right, go on. Get out of here. Uh, where's Jimmy? He's down the hall. The officer there will take you. Yes, sir. Officers? Yeah. Uh, thank you again. You hear? Yeah, you take care of that bad memory, will you? I got it. Headquarters, Smith. Oh, yeah. Yeah? What's the address? Uh, no, he's not here. Just a second, I'll check. Policeman out in Hollywood wants permission to kill a skunk. What? Wants to kill a skunk caught in a trap. I guess it's all right if it's the only way they can get rid of it. Uh 
Well, the way he puts it, it is. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah. What's that? Well, I don't know. You better check with the watch commander. Yeah. Okay, good night. We got an injured animal report. Turns out the people out there had trouble with skunks, got a permit for the traps, and caught one tonight. Once they had it, they didn't know how to get rid of it. Yeah, better make a report on it. Must have been pretty funny. Huh? <laughs> Officer said we could use the skunk in the department. What was that? Officer said we could use the skunk in the department. Says he'd qualify on the target range any day. I get it. Headquarters fighting. No, no, we got the word. Where you been? Check out with a lamp? No. No, we'll wait. 1K5. Yeah. They just picked up a third person in the shooting. Three minutes later, the officers in Unit 1K5 brought in a tired-looking man in his late 20s. His name was Harry Carnell. He'd been drinking, but he seemed to be in complete control of his faculties. He ran his name through R&I, but we found no record on him. The officers also brought in the murder weapon, a 32 caliber automatic. A check of gun records gave us the name of the store where it had been bought and the name of the owner. According to the registration, it belonged to Fred Purcell. The crime lab reported there were no fingerprints on the weapon. We tried once more to talk to Purcell, but again, we were unable to. We asked Harry Carnell, the latest suspect, to tell us the story of the shooting. I went up to the place to collect some money, Mankry phoned me. What happened when you got to the apartment? Knocked on the door and Purcell let me in. Who was in the room? Just him and Mancrief. That's all, huh? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, I came in and said I had to have the loot, and Mancrief told me he was stony. No. Yeah. He said to check him tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, Purcell got on his back, said he was always welching, and the beef started. You mean between them, huh? Yeah, they were both pretty gassed when I got there. You have anything to drink with them? No, no, I had a date, sir. That's what I needed the money for. I got a girl with a pretty big appetite. I was broke, and I figured I'd tap Mancrief for what he owed me. All right. Well, anyway, these two got in a big beef. Purcell told Mankrief to get out. He wouldn't go. So Purcell ran over to a desk there in the room and hauled out this big gun, started to blaze away. How many shots did he fire? Well, one's all I remember. Might have been more, but I didn't spend a lot of time counting. Just one, huh? Yeah. Well, a guy sets a clay pigeon on your head. You ain't going to stand there. What happened then? Well, Purcell pointed the gun at me. He said I should get out, too. I didn't feel like telling him he was wrong. During the time you were there, did you see anybody else at all? No. Fred's wife was around someplace, I guess. Why do you say that? Well, they started yelling at each other. I heard Mancreep say they'd bother Harriet. That's Fred's wife, Harriet. Uh huh. I took off like a big bird. Where'd you go? My place. I had a couple of belts and then walked by the apartment to see what was going on. An old broad there started yelling about how I was the guy who ran out of the place after the shooting. Next thing I know, I got the collar on, and here I am. Uh-huh. What was Purcell doing when you last saw him? I was standing over Mancreep, holding the gun, looking like a cover on a pulp magazine. Are you willing to sign a statement on what you just told us? Well, sure. I got no part in this action. Just went to collect a bet at the wrong time, that's all. Mm-hmm. Pretty lousy night. Missed my date, didn't collect the money, end up in the can. It's pretty lousy. Mm-hmm. But I'm not the only one, though. Old Purcell always thought he was such a great card player. He's a real fish. He lost six bucks tonight. Well, you're part right. Huh? He lost more than that, didn't he? Harry Carnell was taken to the report room where he made a full statement. At 7.03 a.m., Lieutenant Ray Giese from Homicide Division came in and took over the investigation. Fred Purcell was questioned, and he made a voluntary statement that he'd shot and killed Norman Mancrief. He couldn't remember why he'd done it. He was removed to the main jail and booked in on a charge of violation of Section 192 PC, manslaughter. His wife and Carnell were released from custody. We made out reports to all divisions for the follow-ups on crimes committed during the night. At 8.02 a.m., the men on the day watch came in and relieved us. It's going to be a nice day. Yeah. A few clouds up there. Might keep the heat down. Yeah, let's go. You want to stop for breakfast? Well, I guess we might as well, yeah. What do you think, Joe? Hmm? You like to draw the business office for permanent duty? No, sir, not me. I guess okay once in a while. I don't think I'd like it steady, though. Huh? Not busy enough. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 18th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Further investigation proved that the purchase of the automobile by Melville Hulbert was legal and no further charges were made. 
Frederick Neal Purcell was tried and found guilty of manslaughter and received punishment as prescribed by law. Manslaughter is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed ten years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. 